creator, the one who named me. You tell me what to do. You show me where to go. My redeemer, the one true savior, my helper and my friend. Beginning and the end. You're the God of angel armies. If you are known, no one can harm me. In your arms, I feel safe. You never leave. You never leave. Hello and welcome to the virtual convocation of the Springboard Roadshow. As you may know, this is the 15th edition of the Roadshow since the very first one in 2007. This year's Roadshow has been a totally virtual experience with three events. We first held one in April, then in June, and today is our final experience. The 15 years of the Road Show has been an exciting journey of empowering young people with entrepreneurship, talent discovery, financial literacy, and career development. Indeed, over 300,000 young people have been mentored in face-to-face -face meetings across all regions of Ghana with millions having participated virtually over the years. Many of our alums have gone on to do significant things in their professional lives. Some of them now serve as mentors and resource persons in our events and that is very fulfilling. In 2011, in addition to traveling all across the regions of Ghana, the Roadshow went to Lagos in Nigeria and Banjul in Gambia. Both of them are in West Africa. Interestingly, up to 13.9 of all virtual participants of Springboard Interventions come from Lagos, Nigeria and Freetown, Sierra Leone. In the needs of West Africa youth remain very much within our sight. Our theme for this year has been repositioning. It has proved to be very appropriate after the radical changes brought on by COVID-19. Today, our focus for this convocation will be narrowed to preparing for the year 2022. This is important because we have less than two months to enter the new year. We will have Rosie Abe Arthur, an accomplished HR executive and Kelly Gajaku, Group CEO of Enterprise Group as our guest speakers. We also have many young people, including yourselves, connecting and asking questions based on the presentations. Do post your questions, comments, and contributions on our Facebook, Twitter handles at either Springboard Virtual University or Albert N.E. Okran or Comfort Okran A. Today's conversation is very important even for us here at Springboard as we prepare to build stronger institutional capacity for the next level. In May 2020, Springboard was awarded the mandate to execute the COVID-19 Recovery and Resilience program, what you call Call by the MasterCard Foundation. In partnership with Solidaridad, Springboard executed the program which ended up equipping over 23 million young beneficiaries across Ghana with resilience, health awareness, wellness and safety, workplace skills and job readiness to cope with the disruptions of COVID-19. After the program, our coffee table book the Core Tales of Resilience was published. 
It featured 200 inspiring young stories of young people sharing how core had enabled them with the requisite tools and resilience to brave the harrowing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the numerical reach and impact of the six-month intervention was comparable to a decade of our work. CORE also afforded Springboard a rare opportunity to reach Ghana's huge informal sector as well as rural communities with its entrepreneurial interventions, which were translated into Akan, Ga, Eve, and Dangbe. Additionally, all presentations were signed for those who had hearing impairments. The foundation in June this year has initiated another offshoot, the Springboard Youth Dialogues. The Springboard Youth Dialogues is aimed at inculcating youth entrepreneurship, ethical leadership, and values in tertiary students and youth across Ghana. The Springboard Youth Dialogues also provides a much needed platform for young people to engage directly with government about policy interventions that are aimed at Ghana's teaming youth. We would like to thank the Minister for Finance, Honorable Ken Oforiata, for his commitment to this initiative and for traveling with us to Tamale Sunyane and to the recent event in Accra. These successes of the past year confirm that the time is right for Springboard to massively scale up across Ghana and beyond. We are confident that with the right injection of resources and capacity building, Springboard can help raise many young entrepreneurs and contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals, especially goal numbers one, three, five, and eight namely no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, and decent work, and economic growth. Wherever you are watching or listening to us today, get a friend to tune in or log on as we deliberate on repositioning and preparing for the year 2022. 2021 may have been a tough year for many but i hope that the key share today will make your 2022 your best year so far welcome again and enjoy the deliberations god richly bless you over to you albert thank you very much comfort okran executive director springboard Roshu foundation compressing 15 years of springboard into your five minute opening remarks. It's now time for us to scale up to the next level. And we want to start with our presentations, one of two presentations today. And I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for this session. Rosie Ebeata is a top professional with about 25 years of business and HR experience. Rosie was a group head of human resource at First Bank Nigeria Limited with oversight over employees across Nigeria, UK, Ghana, DR Congo, Guinea, Gambia, Sierra Leone, and Senegal. She has worked in leadership positions in the banking and consulting industries in multinationals like Ernst & Young, Ecobank, and Standard Chartered Bank. She was also awarded the Exceptional Woman Leader of the Year in First Bank She's a member of the Capacity Building and Certification Committee of the Chartered Institute of Bankers Nigeria and recently joined Scancom PLC Ghana as an independent non-executive director of the company. Rose is a member of the Executive Women's Network that focuses on developing and mentoring women. Springboard 2021, your guest speaker, Rosie Ibiaza. Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. My name is Rosie Ebiatha and I believe I'm the best HR professional this side of the Atlantic. I will come back to this later. 
thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with me, especially as we come to the last months of the year, which I would describe as probably one of the most contrasting years of our time. The COVID pandemic hit us very early on in 2020 as a health crisis, which quickly morphed into an economic crisis. And it continues in its own cyclical manner to present and challenge in various ways. It has caused many of us untold grief, but has also presented many unexpected opportunities. Technology is said to have leapfrogged three years at least, and e-commerce has evolved 10 years within a year. Businesses have had to change the operating models, and individuals have also had to adapt to new ways of working. The next normal is here. So how should we position for 2022? Or in my view, how do we continually reposition for the next normal? Because we've learned from this black swan event of the pandemic that everything, and I mean everything, can stop. Nothing can be taken for granted, and everything can be redesigned. However, in all of this runs the thread of a silver lining. We must prepare for opportunity or be swept aside. What should we do? And if we have some time, what should companies do? Success may look very different today from what it looked like prior to the beginning of 2020. Today, we hear about the workers' revolution. People are looking for a different kind of life. People are looking for a lot more from work. They're looking for flexibility, family time, wellness, balance, etc. Today's thinking, you may feel, is more towards the developed world than to us, but that's not the case. The changes we're experiencing today are not just for the knowledge workers, not for the talented and skilled individuals who have positioned themselves for change and the speed of change, but we are all part of this revolution and this change if we reposition ourselves properly. The question therefore is, why do some have choice and some don't? Why are some people sought after and others rejected? Each of us, I tell you, is a unique diamond, perhaps in the rough, at the moment. And I believe we all know that a diamond comes from pure carbon under extreme heat and pressure. So what must we do to unearth the diamond in us? Before you embark on a journey, you make a plan. Where am I going? Do I need help? How will I get there? What's my mode of transport? What is the cost? How long will it take? I have learned to think in blocks of 10 years. I came across some food for thought some years back. And I learned from that that 10 years is long enough to start a degree course, finish it, do a master's, and then do a PhD. You can meet your partner, get married, and have two or three kids in 10 years. You can buy a piece of land and build a house. You can start farming, coconut, cashew, cocoa, supply food stuff, all within 10 years. You can start saving and investing in land, real estate, etc., and have an investment portfolio in millions of CDs, all within 10 years. You can also change your career and plan differently for retirement. So tell me, how many of you have set out your vision, aspiration, or plan? What is your purpose? What are you striving for? Define it, make it clear, create a mental picture. Do you look at activities simply as activities, or do you look at activities and how they align to your goal or your plan? Do you check your plan daily? Are you clear? on how you're tracking against your plan. Is the vision clear? 
I put together a vision board last year as I was preparing to exit corporate life. And this board sits in my study where I see it every day. It gives me energy as I contextualize the work I do in the scope of my plan. So talking to you today is part of this plan that I have. This is how I stay engaged and focused. The difference now from how I viewed it in the past is that I have experienced the impact of COVID. So I now review my plan more frequently to ensure it makes sense. Do you have a plan written out? How important is it to you? And how are you tracking against it? Don't forget the success is not a straight line and there may be detours so have you built flexibility into your plan? Let me ask you another question. Who are your helpers or your stakeholders? Who can help you along the way? Get a coach for work-related stuff. Get a mentor who will give you broader advice and support and learnings across life. So work and life integration. Get a sponsor, an influential person. Your voice in the room when you're not there. When an opportunity comes up, who is this person who would say, have you thought about Kwesi for this role? How intellectually curious are you? Have you investigated how jobs are likely to change with the impact of data, AI, technology, digitalization, which is on processes, digitization, which is on information? Did you notice how health, well-being, pharmaceutical, data, technology, connectivity, etc. move to the front row? And did you see how travel, hospitality, etc. took a back seat during the pandemic? What does a new world look like in your mind's eye? Are lawyers going to remain the way they are? What about the banks? Will we need tellers? Will we need relationship managers? What's going to happen? What about travel agents? Are we not booking our flights ourselves these days? If healthcare continues to improve and we live longer, what kind of care will we need as we grow older? Is insurance going to become relevant to us in Africa? We have a large population who do not have access to funds. They don't have access to technology. They don't have access to insurance. McKinsey, in their most their most recent research said that looking over the next 10 years, and let me give you a few of the jobs that they believe through their research are going to be sought after. Electricians, all computer jobs, analysts, developers, etc. Data scientists, ophthalmologists, marketing managers, logisticians, physical therapists, HR specialists, teachers, truck drivers, information security, personal service managers. You would wonder why nurses, medical health managers. Now we're experiencing in Europe a lack of truck drivers. Can you believe it? So DHL packages, etc. are getting delayed. Now we see that we are on our systems longer. So it's not surprising that ophthalmologists are going to be needed. We're going to have to take care of our eyes. Financial managers as well. Charles Munger said, and this is one of Warren Beatty's very good friends, he said, spend each day trying to be a little wiser than you were when you woke up. Become a learning machine. Remote working forced us to look at ourselves and our surroundings differently. And most importantly, how we manage our time and what we do with our time. We suddenly had more time, and yet we had to relearn how to use this productively and how to best integrate work and life. Creativity and innovation became the norm, right from businesses through to individuals. Dyson was known worldwide for making excellent hoovers for cleaning. They started making ventilators when COVID was at its height. Cottage industries sprung up everywhere and started producing face masks and making sanitizers. Instagram became a key vehicle of business. Couriers and delivery companies were everywhere.
Restaurants and retailers moved online. Data is the new oil. Data is king. Employees are moonlighting. They're having side hustles and doing their main jobs. Organizations are struggling to retain their talent. What are you learning? Are you reskilling? Are you upskilling yourself? Have you made a personal commitment to yourself? Or you're still thinking about those nice purple high heels? Or that aftershave? Or that swanky belt? There is a global fight for talent because remote work has made talent fluid. You can sit in Ghana and be working for an organization in the UK or in Singapore or in Dubai or in Kenya or in Nigeria. So what have I done and what do I suggest you think about? I've deliberately learned and adapted to outperform my peers. I'm a hustler. My hustle is real. I've cultivated a growth mindset. So developing my talent through hard work, through good strategies, relying on input from others, I'm able to collaborate, to develop and to deliver. I learn from my mistakes and I grow. Talent is not static. I have considered what the critical skills are that I need for the future based on my plan versus changes in technology and disruption. I learned some years back about three goals in three months, tell three people, three times three times three. Set three goals over three months and tell three people who keep you accountable. I've thought about what am I solving for? Have I identified a problem I can bring a solution to? What value am I bringing to the table? In Africa, for instance, we know that food and accommodation are critical. Are you thinking about these things as you reposition for next year? What jobs are coming up in the next five years? What skills do I need to build in order to stay relevant and marketable? I must adapt. I must change. I must pivot. I must learn. I must move from effort-based to outcome centric. You will find that with remote working, a lot of people are managing outcomes. They don't care where you work. They don't care where you sit. They don't care when you're coming to work. They don't care whether you're working from home, but they care about your delivery. Are you prepared to invest in yourself? Employers are spending a considerable amount of time deciphering how will work be done. That is the content and the type of work. Who will do this work? Are they knowledge workers? Are they consultants? Where will the work be done? At home? At work? Abroad? Is it a hybrid type of work? What are we doing around apprenticeships? Do we need degrees or no degrees? Do we need experience to deliver? Because we're focused now. On outcomes. Your life is really a sum of your choices. So each day you're choosing a different direction. Are your choices about your present self or your future self? These are some of the actions and my thoughts in this critical space. My values, which come from in my life, the God factor in my life determine my choices. My values determine my priorities, my relationships, my behavior, and my how. Honesty, integrity, courage, discipline, trustworthiness, hard work, empathy, resilience, and others that you may be thinking about as we talk about this. I grew up in a household where my father always said, Show me your friends and I'll show you your character. Who do you surround yourself with? Who are the top five people in your circle? Focus on your strengths. What can you do? Not what you can't do. Don't spend too much time worrying about what you can do. Develop your strengths. 
Think about your response to setbacks and failures, both personal and professional. Build resilience. We've talked often around IQ, intelligent quotient, SQ, social quotient that tells, talks about being at peace with others, emotional uh, quotient, EQ, which helps you with building networks, collaborating with people. But now we're talking also about adversity quotient, one's ability to come through a rough patch with learnings. I love turning my lemons into lemonade. I also make a point to take care of my physical self. I need to take care of my physical self so I can operate at my optimal. You need to consider also how others see the world, how they live, how they think, versus your examination of your own mental and emotional processes. Outrospection versus introspection equals empathy. Let's see technology as an enabler. Let's not be afraid of it. It is opening doors to new opportunities and to new jobs and richer jobs that require thinking, advisory, do not get left behind. Be opportunity minded, not opportunity blinded. I have so many people who are so worried about, oh, the machines are going to take our jobs, technology is going to take our job, we have a chatbot now and now customers. No, they're going to allow you to think differently and grow differently. Think about continuous improvement. Create and innovate. Look at what you have before you. Think how you can do this better. Remember, persistence beats resistance every day. Do great work. Focus on delivery and performance. So, my name is Rosie. And coming back to this, I am the best HR professional, the side of the Atlantic. Why do I say so? I joined the world of work in the age of typewriters. I worked as a lone black secretary in the UK to move the organization I worked with in the 80s from MS-DOS, which was a digital operating system that was not fancy at all, to Windows. I worked in production in advertising when companies were focused on marketing and advertising. I moved into HR in the days of gaming when all these video games became the thing. And I worked then with Warner Interactive. I then moved into consulting in Ernst & Young Ghana and was selected through interviewing to take up the role of People Director Ernst & Young Africa, based out of South Africa and oversee 19 countries. I was poached by Ecobank ETI and left ETI as a Group HR business partner with oversight across 33 countries. I then moved to Standard Chartered Bank as HR Head Ghana and on leaving, I was the head of HR Nigeria and West Africa, based in Nigeria. I then changed and moved to one of the largest banks in Africa, with a history of 127 years, the first bank of British West Africa, based out of Nigeria, with responsibility for the footprint in Africa, UK, China, and France. I am now determined in the next 10 years, with the grace of God, to build a new career. Easy to say, but each step I have taken in my past required deliberateness, sacrifice, a plan, scanning the horizon, looking into the future, constantly repositioning, learning, upskilling, reskilling, tears and prayers and chalking some successes. I present to you with hope and faith in your capabilities an ability to reposition and take advantage of opportunities. 2022 and my thoughts on how you should reposition for the next normal. Thank you. Absolutely phenomenal, Rosie. I loved the points, especially the one about three by three by three. Three goals in three months and tell three different people. What's your big point from Rosie? Wherever you are joining us today, just share it with us on Twitter. 
with the hashtag Springboard or post your thoughts on our Facebook pages at Springboard Virtual University or Albert N.U. Okran or Comfort Okran A. Let the world know that you are at the Virtual Convocation of Springboard and you are learning big time. you chat, call, read, play, and listen to music. Enjoy Ayoba with MTN. Download Ayoba now. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from the entire Enterprise family. It's such a pleasure to be able to be associated once again with this all-important program. At Enterprise, our roots date back almost 100 years in this country. We started out as insurance, and because our roots are so strong, along the way, we've branched out into pensions, facilities management, and funeral services, and many more. And in all of this, we have distinguished ourselves, making us one of the most admired companies in Ghana today. In our operations in Gambia, Nigeria, and here in Ghana, we are known for delivering customized solutions that cater for our clients' needs from cradle to grave. We are especially interested in the youth, and so we have identified financial literacy for the youth as one of our core focus areas for our corporate social investment activities. It is therefore no wonder that we associate ourselves with Springboard Springboard consistently delivers for us the target market that is a direct fit with our brand. The nuggets of wisdom that are dispersed from matriculation to convocation are life-changing. It is said that a day spent with a maestro is worth a week of reading. With Springboard, you certainly spend good time with experts. So finally, this morning, my advice to you is that you reposition yourself to enter into a whole new world of learning. And while you're at it, remember that whether it's insurance, pensions, property management, or funeral services, enterprise will always give you an advantage. Thank you. UMB Bank, formerly known as Merchant Bank, was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. From operating solely as a merchant bank, UMB has over the last 45 years evolved into a fully-fledged universal bank, offering services in the corporates, retail and private banking arenas, providing customers with an exceptional banking experience. Through the use of advanced technology and innovative products and services, UMB's 45 years showcase the bank's unyielding dedication to its customers, a move that has resulted in the growing and continued success of the bank. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. UMB's commitment to exceptional customer service has led to long-standing relationships. UMB has speed as their hallmark. Everything is faster because most of the time you want to get back to lectures on time. The customer service is 
excellent and it's brilliant. Universal Merchant Bank provides us with ATM which runs 24 hours and serves the needs of students. A modern bank recognized for its innovative use of technology and distinctive banking solutions, including internet banking and customer-focused initiatives since 1972, we look to the future because we work for the future today. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. It's now time to move on to our keynote speaker for today, and he needs no introduction as springboard because he's been part of this right from the inception. Kelly Gajapo is the group CEO of the Enterprise Group and the chairman of the Data Bank Group. He has been part of this. He's spoken on this platform, and he's a big source of encouragement to all of us here at Springboard. Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Gajiko. Thank you very much, Albert, for that wonderful introduction. I almost couldn't even recognize myself, uh, but I'm going to just jump right into it. So as we round up the year 2021 and before, prepare for 2022, I'd like to share some thoughts on the theme for this conference, which is repositioning. Uh, I draw the title of this, my speech, from Enterprise's marketing theme for the year, which is Dream Big with Enterprise. We chose that theme because we are aware that many of us are held back from pursuing our dreams uh, because of fear. So by this theme, we encourage our clients, and indeed ourselves, to let us handle their fears so that they can be free to pursue their dreams. However, since I'm talking to you young ones, I'd like to tweak the theme a little bit and say to you, dream big, but act even bigger. Uh, before I go any further, uh, let me uh, truly congratulate Albert and Comfort you know, for their incredible passion and commitment to mentoring uh, our young uh, people and empowering them to venture into entrepreneurship uh, and the, and the co crew world all these years. Uh, you're having an irreplaceable passion, uh, and I want to thank you not just for your effort um, uh, at what you do, but truly also for giving people like me a platform um, and giving expression to something as important as youth entrepreneurship and empowerment, uh, which is dear to not just me, but to many people. We really admire what you're doing and please, please, please continue to do, to do more of it. Thank you very much. Now, initiating this uh, Springboard Roadshow in 2007 and sustaining it for the last 15 years is no mean feat. And it is that kind of entrepreneurial or pioneering resilience and tenacity of purpose that will be the crux of my message today. I also wish to commend you, or those of you who are tuning in to this program, for making the right choice. By participating in this event, you are investing in your future and you will surely, surely reap a bountiful harvest. So, on the 25th of February 2012, myself, legal practitioner Yoni Kolindi, who was then chairman of the Springboard Roadshow Foundation, and who is now a Supreme Court Justice, I must add, and a few other mentors traveled to Cape Coast with Albert and Comfort and the team for the sixth edition of the Springboard Roadshow. In the power, the power mentoring sessions preceding the main conference, I spent time speaking with individual students who were keen to know the secrets of starting a business or building a great career. And they thought I, was a, I would be a good source for revealing those secrets. So I shared my own experiences of how we started Data Bank and some of the very difficult choices we had to make for years in order to see our dreams become reality. Some of them were visibly short. My main message for that day was about excellence through innovation and technology. Interestingly, as I prepped for today, it struck me that some of the ideas I put forward those close to 15 years ago 
are even more relevant uh, in today's rapidly changing world than they were when uh, they were first shared, oh, I'm sorry, nine years ago. Don't forget that when we speak in these sessions, we only share what we've learned and applied in our own lives and businesses in the hope that they would also take a cue, that you would also take a cue and achieve even more than we have done with it. Uh, this is the main reason why we mount these platforms, to use our learnings and even our mistakes to inspire a greater generation of achievers such as yourselves. It is humbling to note that lawyer Yoni Colini has achieved so much since then and has, as, as, as I said earlier, has gone on to become a justice of the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court. I've also moved on from my role as Data Bank CEO to become board chair uh, of the same Data Bank and I've also taken up a new role with the Enterprise Group as its uh, CEO. Uh, it's been an amazing, amazing decade of growth and accomplishment for the enterprise group. Now, I'll revisit a few of the items from 2012 as I share with you on dream big but act even bigger. Let me start with a quote from Ronnie Oldman, made popular by Dr. Claude Bissell. Dr. Claude Bissell was the eighth president of the University of Toronto, uh, and the quote is as follows. Excellence is the result of caring more than others think is wise, risking more than others think is safe, dreaming more than others think is practical, and expecting more than others think is possible. Now, Excellence has always been one of my favorite words. It is no wonder that it found itself into one of the five values of enterprise. I personally believe that in everything you do, if you do it with a commitment to excellence, you will succeed. If you approach 2022 with a mind of excellence, you will surely, surely succeed. There's an age-old adage that says, aim for the skies, and the worst you can do is to fall on top of the trees. And for those of you who have a keen memory or who uh, I suppose might be old enough, uh, this is something I said in 2012 to those who were gathered uh, at the Springboard uh, event back then. Excellence can be defined as the quality of being unusually good and surpassing ordinary standards. The difference between being excellent and being very good is that it's just that extra touch. That is where the idea of surpassing or surpassing ordinary standards come in. Excellence is simply a commitment to do more. Not surprisingly, each of the four blocks in the quote on excellence, which I just delivered, involves doing more than what others ordinarily would do. So let's take another look at each of the four as we prepare for the year ahead. Number one, care more. Care more than others think is wise. The sole reason we are in business is to make life less difficult for our clients. That's according to Matthew Hodges. Most businesses are born out of caring for our clients and designing solutions that meet, meet a need in their lives. If you want to become an entrepreneur and your primary focus is on making money without caring about your clients, your stakeholders and your community cannot build a sustainable business. Building a business is about solving a problem for people and getting rewarded for it. That's the primary switch from passion to business. Doing business with excellence means being bold to reject what everybody else says is okay. Jesse Harrison says that involves putting yourself in their shoes, putting yourself in the shoes of your customers. That is empathy. 
The editor who cares about their client will read the script over and over to ensure that there isn't a single mistake that could affect the final work. The surgeon who cares about the patient will take time to carefully read the folder and avoid amputating the wrong leg, you can imagine. In caring for others, you may sometimes look unwise, but excellence ultimately always pays off. At Enterprise, our mantra is caring about you from the cradle to the grave. We want to be an integral part of your life at every stage in your journey. Interestingly, some of our most successful policies have been developed as a byproduct of empathizing with the needs of our clients and brainstorming on how to ease the pain for others. We like to think at Enterprise that we are in the uh, risk mitigation business. Uh, in other words, we want to take on to ourselves the risks that our customers have so that they can go on and do what they do best, uh, which may not be involved in risk mitigation or insurance. That is the spirit in which we must enter 2022. A commitment to be excellent in what we do by caring for people and serving them. For those contemplating entrepreneurship and wondering where to start, think of something you really care about and what possible solutions you can offer and get rewarded for. So you gotta go deep, you gotta look, look for that passion, something you deeply care about. And then the way to monetize it would be to add the, if you like, the commercial model. So it's gotta be something that people will actually want to pay for, that responds to a need. And then when you monetize it, it becomes your passion, you know, uh, that you're sharing with others, but you make something in return. In 2022, care more for others than they think or than others think is wise. Number two, risk more. Risk more than others think is safe. In the coming year, I urge you to step out of your comfort zone and try to do something you haven't done before. Solve a problem. Develop an innovation. Release an ex exciting product or design a new system or ways for doing things. If you have a passion for excellence, you must risk more than others think is safe. Management guru Peter Drucker once said, whenever you see a successful business, someone once made a courageous decision. And that's really what it's all about. I want to pause and express my admiration for several young entrepreneurs who have ventured out in the past few years doing things in fashion, food delivery services, agribusiness, technology, and some really very exciting and innovative product and service lines that simply did not exist just a few years ago. In fact, to be quite frank, uh, over this immediate past period of COVID, a lot of what I'm seeing the young, you young people doing didn't exist even before then. You're building the next crop of companies that will be the reference point in the next decade and beyond. Keep on doing it. Number three, dream more. Dream more than others think is practical. Whatever you can do or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. That's a quote from Johann Wolfgang van Goethe. Dreams are powerful. People, there are many people who will tell you that they dreamt about the venture and went on to build it. If you act on things that are a part of your heart and move from the dream stage into actualizing them, the dream will become your reality. So dream, feel free to dream and dream big. I dream a lot. I dream 
all the time. There isn't a point in time that I don't take whatever craft, whatever product, and turn it around and dream for it to become bigger. If you act on those things that are on your heart and move from the dream stage into actualizing them, the dream will become your reality. So please, dream and dream big. Even if your dream sounds funny to others, you notice that they actually don't sound funny to you yourself. So laugh, but don't laugh. For all you know, a technology is about to be released that will make your dream so easily achievable. Dreams are, are at the heart of innovation. And if you let your imagination be fertile and free, you can come up with solutions to some of the biggest problems around us and create wealth in the process. I'll give you a typical example of dreams and innovation. We've told the story of the five people who approached us from the Bank of Ghana in the early days of Data Bank saying they wanted to form an investment club. That was not our idea. We were approached by five people who said they thought that because of our skills, they would form themselves into a small club. So after agreeing to manage the investment club for them, the numbers began to increase. And that's when our dream or our dreams also began. We began to dream that the whole of Ghana could become one big investment club if we worked hard at it. The dream became the inspiration for the building and the startup of EPAC, which today is virtually a household name or product uh, for those who are in the business of investing and looking forward to securing a sounder financial future. So in the coming year, please dream more than others think is practical. Number four. Expect more. Expect more than others think is possible. The only limits you have are the limits you believe. That's from Wayne Dyer. Anytime you step out and try to venture out and do what others haven't done, the most likely response you will get is, it can't be done. And the people who say that genuinely mean it. And indeed, be, to be fair, they don't even mean harm. You know, they just, they believe in what they see, and but they don't believe in what you are saying because they can't see it the way you are seeing it. But that kind of language should not be uh, a part of your vocabulary. Why do you say it can be done? Have you even tried it? The surest way to fail is not to try at all. That is a guarantee. If you never try, the, the only thing you can be sure of is that you fail because it, you never do it. But what if your venture could be the next big thing to emerge from Ghana? What if the very same thing others tried and failed is what would make you most successful? Sometimes the best opportunities are born out of adversity and uncertainty. The difficulties around you may be many, and indeed, difficulties around us are many. Your limitations may be big, and the challenges around you may look unsurmountable. But decide to step out, confront them, and dare to be different by doing something about them. In 2022, expect more than others think is possible. Reposition yourself for 2022 with a sense of excellence by caring more, risking more, dreaming more, and expecting more. As you step out, let me leave you with a toolkit that anyone would need to make things happen for you, no matter your professional interest. These are simple, very simple attributes that anyone can learn to apply in your work or business as you seek to become excellent. Number one, time. D 
determined to be known as a punctual person. Brand yourself to become known as a punctual person. A person who is always on time is seen as a serious and dependable person. I know of a gentleman, let's just call him Mr. Smith, who is such a habitual latecomer that even though he's a very he's very much alive, his friends call him the late Mr. Smith. Now you might laugh, it may sound funny, but it's really not funny. Needless to say, he has not really accomplished much. If you form a habit of being late, you will one day miss a meeting with a potential financier or a potential supporter or you will get to a place uh, of great good things happening but the door will close just as you get there because you've come late. Always value time. Number two, relationships. Cultivate valuable relationships on your journey. Business and life really is about people. Clients, regulators, staff, stakeholders, etc. etc. Take an interest in and value the people around you. Pay attention to your key relationships and your life and career will be will flourish. Number three, trust. This attribute is really quite critical. Many CEOs and leaders are on the lookout to promote or assign higher responsibility to people they can trust. Be honest, trustworthy, and reliable. Always keep your word and be true to who you are and you will make very significant progress. Number four, tenacity. Tenacity is what helps us pull through life's toughest challenges and still go ahead to achieve our full potential. Lately, we talk about challenges, the easiest point of reference being the COVID-19 pandemic. May I respectfully inform you, may I respectfully charge you, <laughs> may I respectfully let you know that you are hereby barred, stopped, stopped from using COVID-19 as an explanation or as an excuse for any sort of performance shortfall. The world has found ways of either overcoming its negatives or we are learning to thrive despite the challenges of COVID-19. So it is time for all of us to get with the program. You will no longer use COVID-19 as the reason for a shortfall or use it as an excuse for not getting up to do something. I beg you, please. That short window has now finally and officially closed. I know of a 26-year-old man who was forced to suddenly relocate back to this country of of ours from China when the pandemic first broke out now close to 18 months ago. He arrived in Ghana with his wife and their newborn baby without, as they say, two coins to rub <laughs> together. Within six weeks, he set up a solar installation company very little capital, no office, only a website. And today, about six months after, he has done over a hundred solar installations and his business is still growing. His is one of thousands of such success stories that have evolved or have come about through this COVID period. Yours can become one of them. In fact, as devastating as the fallout from the pandemic was, it has taught us many valuable lessons. Lessons such as agile working, the need for prioritization of how we use our time and what we do, efficient use of time, particularly avoiding procrastination.
And above all, the value of human relationships across the board, be it family, or be it your work colleagues, or some social networks. We have learned innovative ways of staying together even while we are apart. Today, determined to flip the coin and take charge of your own life despite any challenges, decide that 2022 will be a watershed year for yourself. Be tenacious. As we prepare to enter the year 2022, please dream big but act even bigger. That way, you and I will meet at the top. So go ahead and come to the top and I'll see you there. I thank you all very much and I wish you the best deliberations for this springboard event as you've ever had. Thank you. In a world where you can be anything, who will you become? When you can go anywhere, how far will you go? When your voice can reach every ear in the world, who will you inspire? When your money can travel faster and further, when you can tell a story in every language, whatever it is, wherever it is, and when you think you've reached your limit, we'll keep you going. Let's go. There once was a man who had it all. He had skill, he had charisma. He was loved by all, but above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. Thank you very much, Kelly, and I love this. Oh, thanks. It's, it's always a pleasure to join you and uh, Comfort. Great job, Dan. Thank you very much. You took us back nine years to February 2012, and it's almost like a seamless transition of thought from then till now, with common threads running through your speech in Cape Coast and your speech here, 2021 virtual convocation. So Kelly, your, the big takeout from your presentation is the point about debarring and forbidding everyone from using COVID-19 as an excuse for non-performance of your goals and objectives. So Kelly, let me find out from you. Rosie shared earlier on, and listening to the two of you, it's almost like there's been a confluence of thoughts or rehearsal of your thoughts. What is your big takeout from Rosie's presentation? I'd like you to share it with our listeners and viewers. <laughs> Actually, a lot, you're right, a lot of what she said was, was part of my own reflection. But what, she dropped uh, a nice gem that she borrowed from uh, Charlie Munger, um, who works with Warren, Warren Buffett. Uh, something about, um, you should try 
spend each day trying to be a little wiser than you were when you woke up. And the key over there is become a learning machine. I like that very much. Uh, I'm taking that, I'm working with that for this year. Because there's so much going on and sometimes it appears rapid. So a bit of reflection and thinking through things uh, ought to be, uh, become more, more of an everyday practice than maybe before. Let me cross over to Rosie and find out from Rosie. Rosie. You also listened to Kelly after sharing your presentation. You must have said, wow, so much in common. <laughs> what is your big take out from Kelly's presentation? Thank you, Albert, for that. And I thoroughly enjoyed Kelly's presentation. And I love the way he broke it down. What resonated with me the most in that was about brand yourself as a punctual person. It goes way beyond punctuality. For me, it's about showing up. And when you're a punctual person, it means you've thought about where you're going, what you're going to do, what you need to do when you get there. So you would have prepared. That kind of uh, preparedness leads to dependability. When you give your word, you stand by your word. When you show up, you show up ready to do good work. People know that your word is your bond. It goes through all that. They build trust because they know that if Albert says he's coming, he is going to come. You can set your watch by his time. He will be there for sure. He will deliver the goods. So it transcends just turning up at 2 when you say 2 o'clock. A person who turns up on time thinks about what they're doing. The person who turns up on time plans. That person respects other people's time. That person is bound to pay attention to his or her network. That person is bound to think about what other people are thinking about with, re re with relation to the subject they're dealing with, because they would want to show up correct, as we say. So for me, that is a big piece of what I believe in. Turn up on time, turn up, turn up prepared, turn up ready, brand yourself as trustworthy, brand yourself as dependable, be interested in what other people do with their time, so show them the respect and make sure that whatever you're doing, you are doing it because you believe in it, you're passionate about it, you care about it, and you've taken the time to think it through. That was a big piece for me that resonated with my own thinking as well. Thank you, Albert. If you just joined us, this is the virtual convocation of the Springboard Roadshow coming to you across various television, radio, and online networks. And wherever you are, tell us the big learning from today's presentations by Rosie Ebiatha and Kelly Gajepu. You can share them with the hashtag Springboard on Twitter and on Facebook on our various pages, Springboard Virtual University, Albert N. E. Okran, and Comfort Okran A. It's now time for your questions. And not surprisingly, I have young people ready, willing, able, and alert on the line with your questions. Let's start with Celestine at Bedon, who is the Women's SRC Commissioner at Dominion University on the Spintex Road. Celestine is a Springboard alumna. So let's start with your Springboard story. Celestine, over to you. Thank you so much. I've joined Springboard since 2011 at Trade Fair, which um, Dr. Mesa Otaba was part of the team, and also Dr. Um, Ken Uforiata was also part of the team that day. And I've learned a lot about confident, working on your confidence and also being able to face um, risks ahead of you. And through that, I'm able to stand in front of individuals and the youth and encourage other people to be able to pursue their goals. Through that, I'm now the Dominion University Women Commissioner. And I'm, I confi confidently say that within the, ten, the next 10 years, I will come back with better stories than the current one I have. Thank you so much. Amazing springboard experience, Celestine. What is your question and who would you like to address it to? Thank you so much, Albert, for the opportunity. Rosie, I'm impressed about your corporate journey as a woman. I have observed as a student leader and a worker that few women are in position of trust like you. My question is, 
how can we encourage women to take up leadership responsibilities in the coming years? Thank you very much, Celeste, for that uh, question, and a very interesting question, especially at this time. I see women moving up the corporate ladder very quickly, and I see women being supported by other women, and then also I see organizations coming together to form women groups. Indeed, I worked as the alternate chairman for uh, First Bank Women's Network, which really focused on ensuring that our pipeline had, was, was fueled with women, but women of excellence. So mentoring for women is important. Helping her, them with the focus on financials and stuff like that is important. Often you find women saying, I'm waiting uh, to have a family before I get on the corporate ladder. Role models are very important to women to show that you can have it all in today's world. Gone are the days when um, you either had to be a spinster, a divorcee, or you know, on your own to achieve what we can see women do today. I believe now that knowledge is also very fluid and very open. So this access, direct access to knowledge, and people are passionate about what they can achieve. So the support is coming through. The um, trust is coming through. The camaraderie, the networks are strengthening. So I believe more and more as we've started to see women are coming through in key positions and they are pulling other women up with them. Thank you. Follow-up question for you, Rosie. So you spoke about women in leadership. Let me ask you about the growing number of women's executive networks. You are, you are a member of one of them. How important are these women groupings in helping to build female executives? Thanks for that question, Albert. Great question. The women's networks that are coming up are critical to the encouragement and the development of women. I have found that being part of the EWN, the Executive Women's Network, I found that I've learned so much from some of the stuff that my fellow uh, women folk are doing. The, their plans, their successes, uh, the, the kind of work they're doing the help they're giving in their communities, growing their communities, sacrificing for others. And I've learned so much from that. And then there's that learning of courage. You know, when you see women do amazing things, I always read up on some of these things that I see done. And I go back and I think, I'm not doing enough. I need to do more. Mm -hmm. So it pushes me out there and helps me to recognize that there's a lot more than I can do and I'm just not doing enough because ideas flow when you listen to what others are doing and you find that you can also help bridge some of these gaps. Thank you for that, Albert. Another follow-up question for you, Rosie. So on our road shows, very often, Comfort would have an event on the wings of the main event, maybe the night before, with young ladies aspiring to be leaders and spend time with them late into the night, hunting for talent and trying to guide or coach them in their career and other life choices. How big is mentoring in the developmental process for young people? Thank you, Albert. It would surprise you how much more we need to learn through mentoring. Whenever you Africans are storytellers, and we love stories, and when you tell a story about your life, it will surprise you how it impacts others, how many other people are walking that journey and are struggling along the journey. And when they hear your story, they just get this feeling of, yes, I can. And they're able to reach out and do more. And also, they realize that there's help. And so it's so important that we mentor, that we guide, and that we choose the right mentors. I'm always an advocate of the fact that allow people to choose their own mentors because they choose people who reflect something in them, who they are akin to, and they are able to learn faster from these relationships. In today's world, 
mentoring is critical. We can't read everything. And in the old days, they used to call it watching Nelly. When you sit and you observe someone, now we have the opportunity to engage, to share, and to grow together. So it is critical that we mentor other women and help them along this journey, irregardless of their age. Thank you. All the way from Tema, Selassie Fume, who is an educator and an author of three books, has a question for you. Over to you, Selassie. I'm very much inspired by the thoughts she's expressed and by her accomplishments as an HR expert. She mentioned um, faith as a key value for her and I would want to ask her how faith connects with her accomplishments and how faith can help me to also attain some level of success. Um, does faith or believe in God or praying, for example, help one to attain success? Thank you, Selassie. Faith and prayer are the very fabric with which I'm made. And I have seen it. I have seen what happens when I pray and when we pray. Um, in our home, we pray as a family. We pray when we are uh, faced with challenges, etc. Having said that, one of the things that one must note is that success is based on performance, is based on delivery, and Kelly mentioned earlier, dependability, trust, showing up, so being punctual. These are all the merits. So you can, you can choose to be religious and not deliver. There's that challenge, and today we see quite a bit of that. And people pray and wait and think, oh, it will happen. No, there are other parts of it. You must deliver. You must be, on, you must be trustworthy. You must be dependable. That on top of dreaming big, caring about others. You know, faith is also around believing inexplicably in someone or something. And so I wouldn't necessarily look at people and say they don't believe in the God I believe in so they shouldn't be successful. What I would like is for us to look at people who focus on the job at hand, who deliver it to the best of their ability, who are prepared to learn and to always stay ahead of the game, to do the right thing, to be dependable, to be trustworthy, to care, to take risk where it's appropriate for them. Those are the kind of things I'll be looking out for. So faith is important and it's very important to me. And I hope that other people have other things that they believe in and religions that they believe in that help them to stay true to delivery and to making a change in the society that we're in. Thank you very much for that question. Let me come back to you, Rosie. And your question comes from Yusuf Mohammed, Greater Accra, Regional President of the National Service Personnel Association. And I won't be surprised if the question is about national service and human resource issues. Over to you, Yusuf. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Yusuf. Um, I would like to know, as an HR expert, as you are, and from your statements, you consider yourself one of the best HR in the sub-region. What is your take on the service personnel being posted to institutions to undertake one-year mandatory service? that tend not to actually get the experience they are supposed to have, but rather being sent on errands to buy things like Wache and others. I would be very, very happy if you can address this issue for me. Thank you. Yusuf, I'm so with you on that. So one part of me looks at it and I just think, we're not doing enough to give people the opportunity of one year to prepare for work. And I challenge businesses to look at this seriously. How would I look at it? In my time, you cannot ask an intern or a service personnel to go down to your car and bring your bag up, to go out and buy watch it. You, you cannot. It's almost like do not even be heard or seen talking about it. But organizations need to look at this carefully because one of the areas I think we've missed out is on workforce planning. 
So speaking as an HR expert, I would say that often we do not know how many service personnel we're going to, we're going to get. We do not know what their backgrounds are. We're supposed to take whatever we get and make them and shape them. If we could build into our workforce plan that lag and assume that based on maybe trending analysis, we're going to get 20 service personnel, where in the businesses can they be used efficiently? This is going to help us in planning, but if we don't plan for them, that is when they come in and they're just thrown anywhere in the business. So organizations must really challenge themselves and take on the piece of how do we mold and prepare our youth during that one year of service to be the best they can be, to actually even think around what is it that I really want to do? What I went into uni for, is it really what I want to deliver? Have I learned something new that is going to change my direction? What are the choices that are available? Let us use this time as a time to build so that our service personnel can get the best out of it and our businesses can also get that extra hand on board to do good work. Thank you. Thank you for that, Yusuf. Great question. Let me cross over to you, Kelly, for the next question. It comes from, surprisingly, a pastor Pastor Eric Ochery has a question for you, Kelly. Eric, over to you. Thank you so much, Reverend, for this opportunity to ask this question um, for Springboard. And I also want to say thank you so much, um, um, Kelly Gajepo, for this presentation, the wonderful presentation that you did. Um, my name is Eric Ochery, and I'm, I'm a pastor of ICGC, as well as a church administrator. I listened to your presentation, particularly my interest is now about uh, technology and how you leverage it for enterprise group and how you have used it to run these companies effectively. I want to know, how can I also, as somebody who works with the church, use technology to really run it effectively and also achieve our objectives as a church? Thank you so much. <laughs> wow, Eric, that's, that's a really good one. But actually, it's been done already. In fact, it, is, it can only be fair to say that uh, modern day churches, so to speak, uh, have taken this almost like they were there before the rest of us are now joining. Um, yeah, I've been, been, been lucky, privileged to go to ICGC a few times and just the, 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 the pure technical production of their service is actually ahead of most businesses already. So I would say if you want to learn, just go to the church and see what they're doing. They're doing it by way of remote. They're doing it also right on the premises by way of production and sound. And you know, when, when the pastor is delivering, they're doing it in so many audio visual. The modern church actually is full of audio visual. So they're on course already. So you can go there and go and learn from them. Interesting question by Pastor Eric and absolutely amazing response by Kelly Gajeku about the applicability of thoughts across various industries and even in churches. Kelly, a follow-up question for you on this same point. You mentioned technology and adoption. Interestingly, that was a point you made nine years ago in your presentation at Cape Coast on technology and innovation as drivers of change. Let me ask you about this new way of working and organizations that have been slow adopters to technology in the face of a rapidly changing world. What is likely to be the impact of companies that have not responded too quickly to some of these changes? Thanks. Thanks, Albert. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely see, see the point you're making. My take on it is that by not deploying or using technology as a tool, Whoever it is, whatever business you're in, you're simply decoupling yourself from the market because the market has moved on and is using technology in so many ways already. Your customers are the end of your technology kit or tool. So if you don't have that kit or the tool, guess who's losing out? So it's not really simply just thinking of it as in how do I use it in the production of my good or my service? It's even more important 
to recognize that the market that you used to follow with your feet, that you used to follow with having a retail, physical retail outlet, is now expanded by several um, times and it's out there in cyberspace and you need the tool to reach them and get them and, and, and do your, your, your transactions with them. So yeah, it's, it, think of it more upside down than you initiating anything. If you don't, you won't find them. But if you do, you'll you find out that they're out there. Douglas is an electrician running a company called Anointed Energy and Safety Construction. His story is simple. During the pandemic, when many businesses were crumbling, he stumbled on the core program and courtesy of the mentoring intervention being given a mentor to guide him through the process, he received important business management skills and expertise to be able to keep his business on track and is now thinking of the next level. He has a question for you, Kelly. Over to you, Douglas. Thank you so much. My question goes to Mr. Gadipo. I know you run a leading insurance company in Ghana. And I want to ask, what does it take to become the best leading electrical company in Africa and even beyond? Oh, I like, I like uh, Douglas, if there's something I like about you, your question or your aspiration, it's scalable, even by way of how you, you presented the, the question. So this is what I would say. Um, when you take a step, for example, I assume that what you're doing now is more relevant for homes. You're wiring and doing, presenting, giving your, your services to homes. I think the way to grow is to button it down, have your foot on it solidly before you put your eye on the next stage. And by doing it that way, it means that you're not going to be losing what you've already created, but you're going to build on top of what you've created. So if, it's, if I'm right, and let's say you're wiring homes, but the bigger market is, let's say, offices, make sure as you develop into the offices that the home, in fact, before you even start touching offices, that you have bedded, what we call bedded the home business. If you do it properly, what it also means is that you can actually have structures which will allow you to pass on or delegate to somebody else who you can supervise as you now move to look for new uh, pastures, which in your case might be, let's say, wiring offices, or maybe even laterally related, uh, but not just for electrical wiring. So the important lesson there is bed what you have done, bed it down properly, uh, so that whilst you move on to uh, wider scope, somebody else who you supervise can be taken care of it. That's how we, we did a lot of our growth at Data Bank. Let me bring you your last question, Kelly, and it comes from an absolutely talented young lady. Nane Kriya Santua Afram is a pencil painter and a public administration student at the University of Ghana. Over to you, Nane Kriya. Thank you, Reverend Albert. I've realized that in other countries, painters or artists get to work for notable people in society. As an upcoming artist, I would like to network with these notable people in society. Um, so how do I get to do that, even in this era of COVID and all its protocols? Thank you. First of all, I, I, I'm assuming the pencil painting is the one that, you know, when you go to events, someone is sitting uh, at a stool and can do a caricature or something. I may be wrong, but it's something in that space. Very exciting field, full of sort of passion. Um, what I would say is the easy way really is do what the, the rest of us have started doing, which is replace your in-person um, encounters with virtual encounters. Now, I know it, it may sound boring because the person sitting right in front of you, uh, and especially you are able to give instructions about turn left, turn right, and all that kind of stuff, is more, is more engaged and engaging than if uh, somehow the person has to be sitting in front of a laptop, and it's a different uh, understanding. Um, it's it takes some thinking through. Um, I'm not one to, 
be prescriptive when I haven't reflected as fully. But I think that this whole area of virtual activity where a person can be miles away and feels like close up is the beginning of your solution. Um, you'd have to nuance it to suit your, not just your talent, but your vocation or what you want to achieve, get out of it. Uh, it's, I, I'm not going to be prescriptive because uh, I don't have all the answers perfectly, but it starts with uh, applying the virtual skills that we now all do. Some of my best meetings, I must tell you, these days are done virtually. So I can, I can see where you can apply that also to your craft. Brilliant question, Nanekria, about painting for accomplished people, and I love your answer, Kelly. But quick follow-up on that one. You did public administration for your master's at Harvard University, John F. Kennedy School. And interestingly, Nanekria is also reading public administration, but she mentions public admin and art. So let me find out from you. Do you foresee a bit of conflict between Nanekria's talent and then her academic pursuits in terms of choosing what she wants to do with her life going forward. Speak to Nanekria. Oh, Nanekria is actually blessed. Blessed because the one I'm assuming, the pencil art one, is a gift and a passion. So I would say she should, uh, Nanekria, you need to hold on to that. Don't let it fade. It is somewhere between a passion that expresses and also a business. You haven't put your, 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 your finger is not on the business one yet as, as broadly and that's just fine. There's, there's a time and a place for everything. But um, um, if you're doing public administration, it will take you into different areas. It's a different, almost like it's a different space, uh, which is fine. It's got its great attributes and so on and so forth. But this other one with the pencil art uh, I, I prefer to think of it as a gift, something that you are passionate for. And one thing I know in, in everything that I've experienced so far is that whenever you have passion, uh, you, can, you can move it in a way that most people who don't have that passion can't. When you've had your bite of public administration and maybe choose to either retire or downscale, this very same skill will come into play as a livelihood. So I would say hold on to it, just create the balance. Create the balance and hold on to it. Because as for passion, it's nothing better than that in life. Wow, phenomenal. And if you just joined us, this has been the Springboard 2021 Rose Show, the virtual convocation, and it's been a very insightful experience. First a presentation by Rosie, A.B. Arthur, and then by Kelly Dajipu, focusing on repositioning preparing for the year 2022 and we've had some very insightful questions from the young people joining us from various places and locations. One thing is certain with the ideas, concepts and prescriptions that have been shared in this program, I am very confident that these young people will look into the future with hope and who knows, 10 years from now when we gather again, they will be mentioning that the thoughts and ideas shared with them have been a key part of their rising to become key achievers for nation, for continent, and for the world at large. Absolutely amazing time together. Let's cross over to Comfort to wrap for us. Thank you, Albert, for hosting this program and doing it so beautifully as always. We are indebted to you. I must say today has been insightful, thought-provoking, and fun. Thank you, my sister Rosie, for your inspiring message. My vision board is now, you know, is, is on top and is, it, it, would, it would not end. Um, I'll look at it every day. Kelly, thank you for challenging us to be deliberate in cultivating our personal and business relations. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of you who joined us today, especially those who sent us questions and comments. We are so grateful to you. Team Springboard, Matthew, Prince, Gifty, and all others. I'm grateful that you are there. Production team led by Nana Aban Kumsing. Invictus, you guys are the best. Above all, 
We are grateful to God that he had mercies on us and we were able to meet and have such a wonderful program. Let's sign up with a song, Baba God, by our teen sensation, Jeffany. Jeffany, take us away. Baba God, oh, you've been so good, oh, you saved me from my enemies and given me new life. Never let me down, oh. 